Here's another example of a proof by mathematical induction. And um, I want to go through first, uh, often we're just going to be, mostly we're going to be given a formula, and they're not going to tell us where the heck they got it. Um, and we're just going to be asked to prove that that formula is always true. And that's a little disappointing. So I wanted to start out with an example where we might be able to guess the formula. So if I take the product 1 over 1 times 2, plus 1 over 2 times 3, plus 1 over 3 times 4, and extend that sequence a while. Well, first of all, what's the pattern of the terms themselves? Not the sum. That's going to be a harder thing. But what's the pattern of the terms themselves that are being added up? And that's a number plus the next number. Well, one way to say that is go out to n, and then the next number is n plus 1. So the pattern here is n plus 1. And here's n equals 1, here's n equals 2, here's n equals 3. And so this is the nth term of that sequence. And I want to know if there's a shortcut formula for adding those up. There's no guarantee that there will be a shortcut. But in a lot of cases there are, and in this case there will be. So let's just do it. <clears throat> 1 over 1 times 2 obviously is 1 half. What about the sum of the first two? There we go. That's going to be, well, let's see. We could do it just sort of brute force, 1 half plus 1 sixth, and that turns out to be 2 thirds. OK. <clears throat> and maybe we can come back to see if there's a smarter way to do that that maybe sees a pattern there. But let's do the next three, or just the first three. OK. So that's the first, some of the first two. That's 2 thirds plus 1 twelfth. If we put that over a common denominator of twelfths, it's going to be nine twelfths. Oh, that's three fourths. Hmm. Already, we might be able to guess a pattern here. One half, three fourths, three two thirds, three fourths. Let's not be quite so bold. Let's do one more. So plus. Keep doing that. Let's take it out to one over four times five. Okay, so that's going to be that three fourths. Oops, three fourths plus one twentieth. Well, the common denominator there is twentieth, so it's fifteen twentieths plus one twentieth, sixteen twentieths. Hey, that's four fifths. Ah, so here <clears throat> it's actually a guessable pattern, which is nice. We've got a guess for. I hope everybody watching this has a guess now for what the answer should be. It's going to be just this number, which is we're going to call n divided by this number, which is n plus 1. So our conjecture would be, uh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I want to control C. I'm not, for some reason, my control key, I'm not pressing it down hard enough, or maybe it's the computer's fault. So the conjecture would be that that's just n over n plus 1. That's certainly a nice shortcut. OK, so let's see why that might be true. Well. We're supposed to get a denominator of just n plus 1. So like here, this number showed up as the denominator there. Hmm. OK. Well, maybe we could redo that calculation. Whoops. It's really not working. There we go. OK. Um, we could redo that <coughs> Excuse me. by putting it over a common denominator of this term. And that's going to be 3 plus 1 over 2 times 3. Because this is a 3 over 2 times 3, and this is a 1 over 2 times 3. OK. So that's equal to, that's equal to 4 over 6. And that seems sort of magically canceled down to be the 2 over 3. Well, it's not quite clear why that, magic, that, thing, that cancellation seems to always happen. So we're going we're gonna to want to watch out for that in terms of how we do this in general. OK, so we've got our, our conjecture. And that's a good place to be, because now we can try induction. And so this is a fairly, this is a strategy that sometimes works. It's not a guaranteed thing. That sometimes if you just do the first few terms, you'll be able to guess a pattern and, and then prove it with induction. Um, there's definitely a lot of patterns that aren't very guessable, though. I just picked one that was supposed to be, that was pretty simple. So we have a few steps for induction. And I want you to be really careful about writing these out in this, this kind of template, because we want to have practice in doing this very carefully. There's what's called the base case. It's really important that 
<clears throat> the process of induction is this idea that if I know that this is true for one thing, like I know it's true for n equals 2, then I'm going to be able to prove it's uh, true for n equals 3. Then I'm going to be able to prove it's true for n equals 4. But I need to start somewhere, or else it's just not going to work. So let's just do n equals 1. And certainly we've done that. That was our first one. Okay, So that works. I'll just copy this down here. As usual, it's not working. Okay, so that works. That what I'm doing is I'm just taking this formula that I hope is true. Let me put a question mark here, or three, to make it sure we know. We don't know this yet. But if I plug in n equals 1, then this just collapses to be the sum of one term, which is this the thing, first thing. And this just becomes n equals 1 over 1 plus 1 is 2. So that's the base case. That works. Now we do the <clears throat> we assume what's called the induction hypothesis. <clears throat> we actually do the rather weird thing of actually assuming that this is true, not for all n, but for some n. So assume that this is true. That sounds like the worst kind of circular reasoning, the most obvious and, and foolish kind of circular reasoning. But what I'm assuming is that some, the way I want to think about it is someone's done this calculation for some particular n, like 217. And all they're asking me to do is check to see if the same formula works for 218. Not that the same, it gives us the, the same number, but the same pattern holds on. And so that's one way I kind of like to think about it. Imagine that n is some specific number, and we want to prove it for the next one. The beauty of it is that we're letting n be a variable, and so it's going to work no matter what number somebody hands us. So for example, even if somebody hands us, hands us n equals 1, we'll be able to prove that it's true for 2. And then we'll be able to prove for 3, for 4, for 5, etc. Okay. So it's not circular reasoning, but it's pretty subtle, the difference. Okay, so we're going to assume that, and we want to prove the same pattern, but for n plus 1. And so that's a little subtle. When you have a summation, this is the summation with n terms, going up to n times n plus 1. If I sub in an n plus 1 in certain, instead of n here, there's two things that happen. One is that the, the last term becomes n plus 1 times n plus 2, but also that there's one more term added. And in fact, it's exactly the same thing as I had plus this next term. And that's because this is because we're doing this special case where we're looking at a sum of a bunch of a bunch of terms. And when we go to the next version of the the conjecture, like this in this case, we went from this guy to this guy to this guy to this guy, what happens is not that these terms change, it's just that I add the new one in the same mold, the same pattern. Okay. So we want to show I'm going to surround this with question marks to make it clear we don't really know this yet. We'd like to show that it f fulfills the same pattern. So I shouldn't put an n over n plus 1 here. It should be, what does this function do if I look at the next case? And that's n plus 1 over n plus 2. So we're just taking exactly what we know, what we're assuming, and we're restating it with an n plus 1 instead. OK. So what can we do with that? Well, the, when we proved trig identities, we talked about how the most straightforward way to prove something is start at one end, Simplify, 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 and use what you know until you get to the other end. And that's what we're going to do. So we have the left-hand side. We're going to write it down. Just writing it down is something we can do. We're not asserting anything about it yet. And then I'm going to re realize that the assumption is that we do know a shortcut for most of this huge expression. We're assuming that the shortcut works if we don't quite include that last term. And so we can s replace that with just n over n plus 1, the shortcut for oops, the shortcut for the previous case, plus the only thing that's new, which is this guy. OK. So now I want to connect that back to this little investigation I did up here. When we put it over a common denominator, that automatically meant that we got a 3 in the bottom. But what the, seemed to be a little bit magical is that the 2 canceled out and gave us something really simple on the, on the top and just the 3 on the bottom. And we're going to see how that works with the algebra as well. Okay, so that's a, this is a really a true statement, given that we're allowed to assume this induction hypothesis right here. And now we just need to do some algebra. What do we want to get? We just want to see this coming out. Okay, well, let's put it over a common denominator, very low-tech kind of thing. 
n times, okay, what's missing there is n, n plus 2. And then that's going to be over the common denominator. Okay, that's promoted this guy. And then I'm just going to add in the 1 that's coming from the next term. Okay. Now let's see. Let's just expand that top out. I'm going to copy it, in fact. And I'm going to get n squared plus 2n. Oh, n squared plus 2n plus 1. That's a familiar thing. And so that is a bit of an interesting thing we have to observe, that this really, it's kind of a nice fact that that factors, and it is going to cancel the n plus 1 on the bottom. That's that sort of minor miracle that happened with the numbers. And so n plus 1, n plus 2. And voila, that cancels n plus 1 over n plus 2. So I'm just calling it a miracle, but it sort of had to happen. This, this really probably isn't a coincidence that these numbers are all so simple. It's probably true, our conjecture. And the only way that could be true is if there's some nice cancellations in, these kinds of, in this kind of algebra. And that's what's going on here, is that this, this guy does cancel out, and we get a simple answer. So we've now prove the next case. Okay. So what we have now at this point we know that any particular case say case n of our conjecture that the truth of that let's say oh, let's just say implies that the truth of that implies the next case which we've just labeled as case n plus 1. And so we also know that case 1 is true. So hence, case 2 is true. Because we just apply this where n equals 1. Now we happen to know case 2 is true al already, but um, even if we didn't know, we would, we would know it from this. Well, that implies that case 3 is true. I don't know why I'm putting that in math mode, but I just am. Well, that implies that case 4 is true. And so on. And this never stops. So if somebody wants to know, is this true for, let's say, case 217, we can say, yes, it's true. Because as long as I know that case 216 is true, case 217 is true. And I know case 216 is true, because as long as case 215 is true, that implies case 216. And that's implied by case 214, and you can trace it all the way back to case 4, 3, 2, 1, and that was the base case. So we don't, you don't always have to say this. Instead, to summarize this, we can just say, this proves the induction hypothesis, and so by or let's say the next case of. We've assumed one, one case and we prove the next case. And so by mathematical induction, the result is true for all n. And that's the, the miracle of induction, is that we just had to do one calculation and this kind of telescoping effect, or like dominoes is the, is the traditional metaphor. We push the first domino and that made all the other dominoes go.